Thank you for sticking with us and joining us. Um, we're moving on to our next topic of uh, frontline and essential <coughs> workers dealing with a sleep apnea patient. And I'd like to just quickly go through and uh, introduce our panel that we have here today. Uh, we have uh, Richard Bren, who is a, a board member for the ASAA, and uh, he's an expert in the um, transportation and trucking industry. So he's going to be able to talk to us a little bit about what's happening uh, in his industry with the uh, employees and frontline workers there. Uh, we have Kevin Bradley joining us. Uh, he um, is a registered nurse that is a trans kidney transplant coordinator in uh, Toronto, Canada, and has uh, recently been moved over to the COVID testing center. He is a sleep apnea patient himself. I don't think I mentioned that about uh, Richard before, but he is a patient. And we have uh, Austin Bren, who's joining us as a registered nurse. He has um, a full-time uh, nursing uh, position as well as some part-time work, and then works with the fire department and uh, as a paramedic. So uh, he is um, out and about in, uh, in shift work and, and dealing with, uh, with all of the time changes on a, on a major scale. So we're happy to have him here today and to talk a little bit about his um, apnea journey. Just so everyone's clear, uh, uh, Richard and Austin are related. They are father and son, so we're going to be able to talk a little bit about the familial aspects of, um, of uh, sleep apnea. And then and joining us as experts, are uh, we have uh, Dr. Zizi Satius from the University of New York um, School of Medicine. He's joining us back. Thank you very much. We have Dr. Alana Oberstein from the University of Miami in Miami, Florida, and uh, Dr. Joseph Borelli, who uh, is a board member for the ASAA and um, located in um, South Carolina, right? Radiologist, correct? I got it. Imaging okay. Center, Great. Thank you. Well, I'd like to lead off. Um, can with Richard here uh, to help me moderate this section and hear from, um, I take a couple of minutes and hear from uh, Kevin, Rich, and Austin separately about um, with this COVID-19 era going on, um, what is different in your frontline essential worker job? Um, how is that affecting your sleep, the stress management that you're facing? And, you know, what, what has changed from what you normally did for, at work to what, what's happening now? So if, if I could kick it off with maybe Kevin, would you start off? Thank you, Justine. And just before I start, um, earlier on today was awesome. Great job, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I mean, since this all started, I guess, um, prior to working now in the COVID assessment center, I actually, you know, was a kidney transplant coordinator and specifically working up the living donors. Um, that has since stopped um, because most of the elective surgery is now on hold. And um, so we decided, like, we did start a COVID assessment center. We built it on a weekend. And I man that pretty much every day. We are still seeing patients um, that are post-transplant patients, kidney patients. Uh, the most recent ones being, we're seeing it within, had a transplant, sorry, within the last six months. So it's interesting. I remember earlier on, there was discussion about telehealth. And um, most of the patients we're seeing, we need to see some people in the clinic. Um, but the majority of patients were actually using telehealth. And it's interesting that one of the doctors said to me, actually, there was a survey recently that over 80% of patients that were surveyed would prefer in future to continue with telehealth. Um, and I feel that's just a shift in people not wanting to come, um, come to hospitals and, and feel vulnerable. Of course, these people are immunocompromised um, because they're on anti-rejection medication. So my whole role has changed quite dramatically. Um, when we talk about how it's affecting me or sleep, um, I feel like a few weeks ago, I sort of hit the um, peak of my exhaustion. Um, the work itself isn't tiring, but when you're at the COVID assessment center, we're all in PPE all the time for eight hours. Um, so it's just, you feel like you're on and cautious all the time. It's very well organized, very well controlled, uh, but I just feel exhausted. Now, the other thing that we were doing in the actual center itself, the physical space, is we were feeling that there was a lot of our marginalized communities, um, people that are um, have mental health issues, addiction, 
homeless people that were coming through the assessment center. So we strategized a way to avoid that contact and have people out on the streets coming to be assessed. So we actually just recently took our uh, testing, what we would call on the road. So we basically have visited a few homeless shelters, um, quite a few long-term um, care facilities, and just you know blanket tested all the residents, all the staff. So that in itself is is a great achievement, um, and as exhausting as it is, it's it's been really valuable. Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting what you're talking about in regards to you know, reaching out into those other communities. We're going to talk a little bit with that with Dr. Sasers uh, in a little bit, but if he would want to chime in here just for a moment to kind of um, talk about maybe what other areas are doing to reach out to all of those other uh, communities that are underserved. Sure. So thanks again um, for um, putting a fantastic panel together. Um, and so one of the things that we have been doing um, at NYU um, including myself, our group, um, as well as the several health centers that we have throughout um, Manhattan, as well as the outer boroughs, such as Brooklyn, Queens, um, and the Bronx, that we essentially um, try and engage um, our community health workers um, to be champions and credible messengers so that um, members of the community are aware of the necessary um, health centers that actually um, conduct um, COVID testing. Um, it's absolutely important that we do that um, because so many folks actually stay in their homes um, suffering and we, do not, we don't want that at all. Um, and so um, we have several family health centers um, that have several clinics. Um, our institution has um, screened um, thousands upon thousands of, of um, you know, New York citizens, as well as our other um, healthcare collaborators as well, um, that have really done a fantastic job trying to reach out to um, folks, not just for COVID, um, because I'm sure we'll get into this even more so, um, but when we look at um, vulnerable populations, such as racial, ethnic minorities, as well as low-income communities, they actually suffer from chronic health conditions, which varies from cardiometabolic conditions, respiratory illnesses, such as COPD, asthma, and the like. And they, those individuals need to ensure that their care is taken care of as well. So we're trying to do several things. We're trying to boost up our telemedicine um, infrastructure, um, a significant portion of our telemedicine um, work um, is done by, by our, our primary care physicians and the like. Um, and what we've done as well is to engage community health workers. We've hosted several town halls um, for our communities that we serve um, to provide as much information as possible. Yeah, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Austin, are you here? I have a lot of pictures. <laughs> I was hoping that you, you just, is he here? We just lost him. We just lost him. Okay. Well, we'll go to the first Bren then. That's you, Richard. <laughs> the old man. Yeah, right? Since you're here with us. Um, so why don't you talk to everybody, that, all of our attendees that are here today about, you know, our frontline essential workers in the trucking and transportation industry and kind of what's happening now uh, with this COVID era. Uh, we have always spoken to you about the uh, high propensity for sleep apnea to be in that um, that population uh, of those workers and how they're managing that, how they're, you know, dealing with everything that's going on uh, right now with all of the changes and the pressure that's been placed on them to help the rest of us out. You bet. Appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, again, I, I am an essential worker in that I provide insurance and surety to transportation companies. I sit on a board with the Arizona Trucking Association. We hear it from our customers. And so I, I love the acronym AWAKE, you know, how do we stay alert and well and keeping energetic? How do people keep from overcoming the anxiety? And 
and we speak in our industry of waiting for the cliff where transportation is going to fall off. And so as, as we look at it and, and what's going on recently, not to, not to get too far afield, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration just released new hours of service. So that's going to go out into the public that later this year, they're going to change the number of hours and how drivers log their hours. Uh, during this current time, if you're providing the essential items that are needed, you can often, well, not oftentimes, you can qualify to operate outside of the normal hours of service, which are so many hours on duty, so many hours per week. So these, these people are busting it so that we have stuff. And yet, you know, what, at, at what cost, right? And many of them are concerned, especially a long haul truck driver who's driving into a zone where they don't know and many of these warehouses in that are very unfriendly to the fact that they may be bringing in COVID. And so, you know, suddenly you can't access restrooms. Truck stops have shut down their dining areas. You talk about being in a quarantine, you're living in that truck, period. You can't get into hotels. You know, we've seen a lot of great outreach in that they're trying to provide free food and, and the like. But, you know, a truck driver mentally, also, you know, the anxiety that comes with all this and then that possible depression of being, um, what, what was one of the earlier speakers today said, solitary confinement. They're, they're really locked into that tractor trailer anymore. So, you know, think about that. I, I sit on a board with the Arizona Trucking Association as we listen to them. Think about you trying to keep your workplace clean. You got to keep all those cabs clean. You got to keep your facilities clean. Uh, many of them have had employees get ill. So, you know, they have to pull them off. And, and then they're concerned about how that illness possibly was on set due to their trying to decontaminate, right, and, and deal with these issues. So there, there are a lot of challenges for sure with trucking. There's a lot of heroes, you know, just like the frontline people are, are, are applauded and lifted up. We appreciate it. But there, there are so many factors and the difficulty I am looking, I, I personally was working from home. I've had to go back into the office because of a new employee. We're looking at our, in the next few weeks, how are we going to bring people back in? And it's going to be weird. I hate to tell you that, you know, acrylic barriers going up, checking people's temperatures as they come in. Um, you know, the likes of many of these transportation companies have done that already to their people. You know, they're running around with gloves on, masks on, they can't find enough Purell and Lysol wipes to deal with these things. We've, we've had to go out and find providers that can give these trucking companies the essential cleaning agent. So it's, it's been extremely disruptive. And many of them, unfortunately, are going to find economic peril because let's say you were providing food to restaurants and the restaurants are closed. You know, you, you're, you're out of business. People that have done major tours you know, the, the road shows and things like that, those kinds of carriers are, are possibly, if not already, bankrupt. So there are huge economic implications, which further lead to anxiety, sleepless nights, right, and other problems. Right, right. Yes, um, I, I recently I saw something um, come across on uh, PBS. They were doing a, a, um, a little vignette on uh, truck drivers, and it was actually two women that were a team together and they were uh, documenting and showing that all the places that they might have been able to stop, just like you say, get out, interact with the other individuals, have a meal, use the facilities, are now just closed. I, you know, I think the woman uh, said that, you know, she's been eating the hot dogs from the gas stations for the past four meals because that's the only thing that's open. And, and a lot of the, because of economic cutbacks, a lot of states have shut down the rest areas. Right. And, and that was also, to a certain extent, public health concerns. Well, we got two or three of them opened up again in Arizona, and then there was a special allowance to let food trucks go out there so that they could get the essentials they need, food and water, because, you know, they can pull into a, a place that maybe has an outhouse and park their truck and get some rest, but I still can't eat, right, yeah. and, and get fluids. So yeah. lots of challenges. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I think we have um, Austin here, do we? I work in three different areas. So primarily on a cardiac floor, which 
with everything happening. Um, the f many floors shut down. We were turned into a rule out floor and a COVID floor. Um, so we noticed uh, patient census was down dramatically, but patient acuity was very, very high. So while you're taking care of two to five patients, they all were very demanding. Um, so it was, it's been very stressful in that regards. And I also work in, in ER on the weekends. And again, there's been less people coming in, but they've all been very sick. And then trying to do all the rule outs, the first few weeks of all of this, it was taking three to seven days to get results. And then you wouldn't know if you were exposed to anybody until way after the fact. So we had that to overcome. So everyone's wearing masks everywhere inside the hospital and out. And then when it comes to EMS, you're going to people's homes. You don't really know what you're exposed to. Talk about cleaning up all of the ambulances after the, after the fact when you get the patients inside. And I think we had three different people who've been exposed from they had worked a cardiac arrest, so they were exposed, and one of them ended up in an ICU, so we're short-staffed in that regards. So then uh, you just have that stress as well to be aware of whenever you come home. So it's been pretty intense. Um, yeah. And then, go ahead. Can can you speak? Can you speak a little bit to tell you know our attendees here that are listening a little bit about like you know just your your daily sleep schedule and kind of how <laughs> that is? Um, I I had when you and I uh, introduced to each other, I mentioned that um, uh, Kevin Bradley uh, used to be my neighbor, and I remember when he was working uh, the different shifts that he that he had. But you're um, you're in the thick of it now. Um, yeah. So Monday through Friday, I work nights, and then I work days on the weekends. And then I pick up 24-hour shifts at the fire department. So finding a routine for sleep is really non-existent. It's just making it a priority whenever I'm not at work. Um, so that's just been more about discipline than anything else. There's really mm -hmm. no great way to go about it if I'm not at work. It's just not being distracted. Coming home, the first thing you do is just get cleaned up wash all the uniforms and get to bed yeah. that's about it yeah okay okay kevin do you remember the the days when you had all the different shifts and and trying to drive home well you know yeah thank you i was going to just ask to jump in there because austin i was curious i think when justin had uh you know suggested that you were coming on it was said that maybe you were a quote-unquote undiagnosed sleep apnea patient yeah. And um, it's interesting because, you know, when Adam and Justine had been my neighbors, I was also doing, you know, the deceased organ donor side where I also would work 24-hour shifts on call. And of course, you know yourself, we're tired all the time and you just put it down to your actual, um, your job. And it's interesting that Danielle earlier had said, you know, you're usually prompted by your sleep partner to go and get help um, because of snoring or tossing and turning. Um, so, you know, I would be, even though your, your schedule sounds like exhausting, um, I wouldn't um, be thinking that maybe that's just because you're working too hard and you should really take care of yourself by, you know, using a, a, a machine for, for therapy. But, um, you know, I appreciate the fact that a lot of people have, you know, demanding jobs and it's actually become more demanding these days. Um, but again, you know, I think we're all trying to be mindful that um, we do need our sleep and rest and exercise and diet and <laughs> a little bit of fresh air, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Sasha, so if I could pull you back in for a minute and talk a little bit about um the communities that you work with and their relationship to being an essential worker and managing their their daily life and 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 monitoring their sleep and making it a priority, uh, like Austin is saying. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm glad you brought me back in because one of the things that um, I really want to impress and and I think you know obviously in the initial wake of COVID we felt that it didn't discriminate against. Um, anyone depending on their race or ethnic backgrounds. And so one of the things that we've been seeing in New York City is that, in fact, it does. Um, and so when you look at and you peel away, why is it that um, COVID um, infections, particularly positive case infections, have been skyrocketing in New York City? 
um, especially since we've had the stay in shelter for quite some time, when you peel back and look at the data, you actually see that it's actually frontline essential workers who are actually most affected. Um, when you look at the lion's share of our essential and frontline workers in New York City, they're generally from black and brown communities. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the geographical landscape of New York, yes, it looks fantastic with all the skyscrapers, but specifically in the outer boroughs where most of the city lives, that people live in very dense um, settings. And so you may have a building with thousands of people in small square footage apartments. And so it's hard to really stay socially or physically distant. And what we're seeing is that um, nurses, um, as well as anyone in the healthcare ecosystem who still have to go out to take care of the citizens and the public, um, are primarily black and brown folks and they're disproportionately affected. I mean, one of the notices that um, you know we've been following quite keenly is when you look at the um, public transportation um, sector, which is primarily um, African American and Hispanic. When you look at nurses um, as well as drivers, when you look at folks who run these nursing homes, they're um, predominantly African American as well as Hispanic. And if you look at even certain in America as well. Um, in Queens, those areas are significantly burdened um, by, by, um, by COVID. And when you look and see that um, these individuals um, are frontline workers, they can't get a break at all. And so it's important to note um, that your zip code, unfortunately, um, can determine um, um, whether or not if you're sick or not. And these people go out and are heroes um, in many ways, but unfortunately, we're not doing enough to protect them. Um, and so we're, we're really trying to create different initiatives, whether to give more PPE or to create situations where these folks um, can actually be protected um, when they go home. Um, I think it's absolutely critical that we do that. Yeah, thank you. I agree. Oh, you're welcome. I I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Oberstein and Dr. Borelli into the conversation. I'll kind of toss it to uh, Dr. Oberstein first and ask her, um, you know, as a as a clinician, how uh, this COVID era has has changed how she's managing her patients, and and um, you know, talk a little bit about how patients can advocate for themselves right now uh, since we're kind of all at home. Yeah, she's absolutely. Still- um, I want to thank the the American Sleep Apnea Association for for bringing me on this uh, panel. It's a great honor and privilege, and it, it it's about a pivot. Um, if I recall correctly, this pan this uh, summit was supposed to be in Miami live uh, today, and uh, we were going to be at the Newman Alumni Center at the University of Miami, uh, uh, and you pivoted and you've. I think we're going to go to talk to Borelli. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go to him first. We'll see, see how you're going. Maybe one of your kids can get off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll let Dr. Borelli give it a chance here about how okay. things have changed with your practice and, you know, in, the, in this uh, time of COVID. Right. Thank you, Justine Adam and uh, the ASA for giving this opportunity. Um, I am a clinician, uh, a radiologist, and MRI specialist. I have a, an imaging center in South Carolina, and we're the busiest in South Carolina in terms of MRI. We do MRI only. We do normally would have done about 7,000 procedures in 2020. We're probably going to end up doing about 1,500 now. So we would space patients. We would perform about two and a, 2.5 procedures per hour, and now we're doing one patient per hour, and we're only scanning patients that are deemed the, whose care is deemed uh, medically urgent. So we have this huge backlog of people that uh, are scheduled for an MRI, but not until their physician says, hey, this needs to be done within the next week, or could it impact the patient adversely? And of course, we're um, social distancing in our waiting room. We only have one patient in there at a time. Um, we're having patients bring their own uh, uh, facial coverings, and our staff is wearing facial coverings. And of course, um, pretty much we're utilizing, otherwise utilizing universal precautions as we always have, because anyone can walk in with any virus at any time that may be, you know, pre-symptomatic and contagious. 
but yeah, it's had, it's had a huge impact. And, um, and if you want, I can talk about my thoughts about, you know, the, uh, what the overall impact on healthcare can be at, at, at a later point, uh, or, or move on. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to you. We're going to try to uh, see if uh, Dr. Oberstein can get back in here. We're going to give it one more try. Yes. I have three <laughs> children doing remote learning and homeschooling now. So I did kick one of them off. The ninth grader is no longer uh, uh, in his class. So uh, again, thank you for having me here. Like I said, your organization has done a pivot and moved to a virtual platform for your community. And similarly, as a rheumatologist, I have done so for my patients. Uh, we are under the shelter at home order. And of course, our patients are immunocompromised. So we have launched very vigorously telehealth uh, in my clinic and uh, really a comprehensive uh, launch whereby we're having our patients really become their own advocates, utilizing the technology, not just to uh, perform the synchronous audio visual communication at a health visit, but to utilize their patient portal, become familiar with that, uh, be able to see their own lab results. If they have a question to provide us with an email intramail uh, with the doc to engage in further discussion. So I personally think, although we're utilizing telehealth to keep people at home um, and yet keep them out of urgent cares and ERs to give them medication refills or deal with acute issues that are not COVID related, we are also uh, leveraging the telehealth to embark on better engagement, which hopefully will have improved outcomes for patients. So that's been a, a huge part of what I'm doing. I would also say that COVID uh, continues to be mysterious, and that's very important. And uh, we, we have to uh, continue to communicate with our colleagues and, and patients. Uh, as a rheumatologist, we're starting, again, to hear word uh, that has come from New York and uh, abroad of this pediatric illness that's presenting, uh, a Kawasaki-like vasculitis, and we need to learn more. We need to collaborate. Um, this is a disease that at first we were saying didn't affect children, and now we're seeing that's very different. Um, you know, similar to sleep apnea, where people would think that this is more of an adult disease, and we all know that there is a pediatric uh, community as well suffering. So I think we need to keep our eye on the pulse of what's happening um, and continue to communicate. I think also we need to have grace with ourselves, um, um, as the nurses in, on this chat have already discussed, you know, hours are difficult, patient load is difficult, talking through PPE is exhausting, you almost feel lightheaded and, and feel like you're having hypoxemia when you're talking through an N95. Um, and so we must take care of ourselves as healthcare providers so we can then take care of our patient population. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to circle back Matt, with, sorry. go ahead. Oh, yeah. you know, just sorry. I, I just going on what Al Alana said and you know, you're, you're spot on because I think now we are on week nine or maybe going into week 10 of the COVID assessment center. And when the screeners are initially screening patients that come through, um, the list of symptoms now has become huge. I mean, it was changing. Our protocols were changing pretty much every day or even maybe twice a day. Um, initially, of course, it was like flu-like symptoms, you know, general malaise, um, sore throat, runny nose, headache, fatigue, shortness of breath. Now we are adding, like you said, things like, you know, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, um, conjunctivitis. Some people do complain of pink eye. Um, you know, we did speak earlier on of like the loss of sensation of taste and smell. And um, a few weeks ago, I was actually on the screening side of things. And this lady came in with COVID toast. And I had not heard of it before. And of course, we're seeing, you know, this Kawasaki rash specific, specifically, sorry, in kids as well but also in adults. And, um, you know, some of the most recent uh, symptoms we're also hearing is, you know, we've always had people come in with chest pressure or this guy actually said, I feel like someone's sitting on my chest. But delirium as well has also been kind of in the forefront as well as falls. Uh, 
Some people are walking down the street and say, I just fail and I didn't really know why. Um, well, we were talking earlier about fatigue. I was joking with people about three weeks ago that I had COVID brain. <laughs> I'd coined that phrase a while ago. But that is, people are coming back saying, um, I feel like foggy all the time. I have a bit of delirium. And some articles I read from some psychologists are, you know, the brain is screaming at the moment and we're in this fight or fight, fight or flight um, situation where we're not able to do that because it's a slow process and it's changing and we just don't really know how to handle it. So it's a very interesting virus where people are just coming up with new things all the time that I think people should be aware to monitor and self-monitor these types of symptoms. And I think earlier today on, uh, on the panel this morning, um, you know, a lot of the experts there were talking about um, the confinement aspect. And, you know, so now people maybe are able to nap and they weren't before and this, and you just get kind of in this weird, foggy place that you were talking about. I mean, you are out there every day. Uh, we are here at home working. So it just, you know, it creates, as we said, with a, what day is it? You know, uh, we unfortunately, you know, we were talking about East Coast time. Someone was talking about West Coast, like, you know, pass it, <laughs> and no one thought to ask, <laughs> you know, but um, I'd like to maybe have Dr. Borelli jump in and and talk a little bit since uh, Dr. Oberstein was talking about um, with telemedicine and telehealth and connecting with patients that way. You said that you had a um, some interesting things to say about the, the moving forward of, of medicine right now. Yeah, well, well, technologically, yeah. Um, and for example, my facility, all of our data is stored in the cloud. There may be some infrastructure uh, impacts long term as we see some, you know, the workforce not able to support the infrastructure. So, yeah, telemedicine is obviously great uh, and it's huge. And we've got you know, the fact that we're on Zoom now that can be used as a tele telemedicine platform. And, uh, you know, going forward, I think I, I want to touch on uh, what, was, what uh, Kevin just talked about, about this virus being novel, though. You know, I think right now, to, it, there's sort of this acceptance of a certain level of, of disease prevalence, like that, that a certain number of cases is okay, or a certain number of the percent of the population, it's all right to have been infected. Imagine if this was a new drug, if this virus is a drug that was just invented six months ago. It takes drugs many, many years to get FDA approval and billions of dollars. A virus is much more complex than any drug ever manufactured. We have no idea what it's going to do. There are at least seven viruses that humans get regularly, including human papillomavirus, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, which causes infectious mononucleosis. It also causes lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, herpes viruses, HIV, we, we know, causes a T-cell lymphoma. We don't know that this disease does not cause cancer. It may cause lung cancer. And it kind of just strikes me that we're just like stepping into this unknown world. And, and it's, again, there's this general acceptance that some level of prevalence is okay. Maybe we can open up colleges and schools, and if a few people get it, we isolate them, and everything's going to be fine. I just think that's very, I think it's unconscionable. Um, and, you know, maybe others want to jump in on that, but I think it's, wow, it, it just blows my mind. I think we, you know, we need to keep our infrastructure intact and take whatever risks we have to take to survive. But beyond that, I mean, wow, uh, it, it's hard for me to imagine uh, going back to life as usual until we have a treatment or a vaccine that we know that we know works. It's going to be years, so it's it's kind of crazy. Um, I also, if it's okay, touch back, touch on the you know, aspects of being a patient uh, with a sleep breathing disorder. Uh, I was diagnosed many years ago after many false uh, negative tests. Uh, by the way, I want to touch on the the test for the antigen for the virus. The latest study published, I think, three days ago, shows that the antigen tests have a roughly twenty to forty percent false negative rate, meaning you have the virus, you may be infectious, but you just had a test that says, oh, you're okay to go to work, which we know does not mean the case. that's the case. Um, so the tests are not perfect and they're very imperfect right now. So to rely on those to bring people back to work and have close proximity is, is nuts. But um, uh, as a patient, you know, if you know someone that needs a sleep test, they can be done now at home. I think there's going to be a huge shift towards home sleep testing. Uh, this company, Itamar, has this watch fat one, which is completely disposable. They mail it to you, you, you wear it overnight, and the test results go to your doctor, and you never have to have any contact with anyone in the healthcare community, except through maybe via telemedicine. 
So I think that's great as well. The other thing I want to talk, talk about just in terms of the virus that I think has been touched on too much. Um, if you look at closed cases for the World Health Organization, these are people that either have died or have quote unquote recovered or been discharged. The, 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 the mortality rate is 15%. And I think that's been kind of pushed down. We keep talking about mortality rates that maybe one to 5%, but that's taking into account people that are asymptomatic or mentally symptomatic that don't impact, that don't come into the healthcare system. As a patient, I want to know if I have symptoms, what are my risks? That's what I want to know as a patient. And ironically, um, several weeks ago, while in isolation with my family, all eating the same food, same exposure to the environment, I came down with severe diarrhea and fever just out of the blue. So, oh my gosh. I went, looked online, read some studies. There was a study out of uh, China, showed it that in 20% of hospitalized patients, the initial symptom was diarrhea. And those patients actually did worse. And I had fevers. So I did some reading and maybe controversial. I prescribed and took, took hydroxychloroquine, knowing it's one of the safest drugs ever made. It's, it's been created, was invented in 1955. It's on the World Health Organization of, of essential drugs. Unless you have a rare cardiac problem, arrhythmia, or you have QT lengthening, or you're taking drugs that, that interact with it, it's a very safe drug. And I thought I would be unconscionable at that point for someone not to even prescribe it because it may work some initial studies. So um, as a patient, you know, I and, and a physician, I prescribed it for myself without any hesitation. And uh, you know, I think we shouldn't politicize that. Um, there was a question earlier, if you want me to touch on this now, someone wrote in a question about hypoxic, anoxic brain injury. Would you like me to touch on that briefly, Justine? Uh, I don't really remember that. Sure, sure. Go ahead. I got a question that says uh, a question about hypoxic, anoxic injury and MRI. And it came through and I said, I'd answer. So as an MRI uh, physician, um, MRI is exceedingly sensitive uh, and is the study of choice for looking at injury to the brain caused by hypoxic or anoxic brain injury. Hypoxia meaning you're not getting enough uh, oxygen into your blood or, and hypoxemia is actually technically the measurement of oxygen in the blood. If your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, it can be injured as we know. The area of the brain, uh, interestingly, that's affected by uh, hypoxic uh, anoxic brain injury is uh, is the hippocampus, which we also see is damaged in sleep apnea. You know, there was a study in uh, Italy about 10 years ago, maybe not quite 10. They showed the hippocampus, hippocampus which uh, stores short-term memory and working memory, which then gets transferred to long-term memory when you sleep, we believe. Um, and that's also the, the area of the brain that's affected mostly by Alzheimer's disease. We can actually measure that with high accuracy. And we do that in our clinic all the time, which quantitatively. And that area of the brain is affected uh, by hypoxic and oxy injury in patients that have COVID-19, that go on, that need ventilators, ventilator support, um, they can have these same injuries. And this is one of these sort of things that you can be left with if you're in that recovered category that is now reported, people that have recovered from COVID-19. That doesn't mean they've recovered and they're fully healthy. They're recovered and who knows, possibly a remote risk of some sort of cancer down the road. We don't know, we can't say for sure. Uh, other injuries to other organs, and obviously, obviously brain injury that's permanent, uh, lung scarring that may be permanent. There's an Olympic athlete, Olympic swimmer that had this, and he can he, he gets out of breath walking to his, he's recovered now, and he gets out of breath just walking to his mailbox and back. So I, I'm just very shocked at how <laughs> we're, we seem to be downplaying the long-term unknown risks of this, of this illness. Right. Okay. If I might yeah. jump in, I, I, I mean, if I just add a different perspective. So I think that is um, absolutely correct. I think it's not necessarily people are don't playing. Um, I think just I just think this is just just natural human reaction to the uncertain and the unknown. Mm -hmm. So I think what you just outlined are potential symptoms, but they could be risk factors, or it could be just the sequela of having COVID. Um, and I think this is where we need more data. And I know many hospital systems are trying to do this. Um, I would, you know, hearken us to look at um, the National Response Portal, which is a, um, it's an organization um, or an initiative rather that is spearheaded by several health centers as well as Google, where they're trying to get all the data throughout um, the United States and the world to better understand phenotypic presentations as well as how do those different phenotypes and profiles may actually relate to the rate of infections, 
the rate of morbidity as well as the severity of disease progression as well as mortality. So I don't think it's not, I don't think it's necessarily we're downplaying it per se. I think it's just how the country in many ways and just natural human nature, how they deal with uncertainty. I must add though, that our approach to dealing with this as if it's a warlike initiative as opposed to a natural disaster plays into some of the tone deafness and some of, um, I guess, the nonchalance that people may actually speak to. Because when you're talking about a, when you use a warlike paradigm to address this, what oftentimes happen are several things, such as you will uh, anoint those people who are heroes in many ways, and you will get to understand and just think of this as a new normal. Um, and I think that's just how people are trying to cope with the stress and the burden of rising statistics of deaths as well as morbidity and just being fearful that they are going to be next. And not to mention the fact that there are some have been affected um, or we are affected, either a loved one or a friend who has contracted COVID. Um, and I think those are some things that we have to be able um, to, to be able to tell the public um, that, hey, we don't really know much about this. We're learning as we go. Um, but we still need to see how is it that we can readjust to this new normal or new abnormal. We have a few questions uh, in the Q&A, and um, a lot of them are related to moving towards telehealth. So, you know, I'd like, you know, Dr. Oberstein and, and Kevin and, um, you know, and Austin, who are kind of there on the front lines, to just chime in talking about, you know, which degree do you think doctors were still to use telehealth in, in the long term? Um, you know, does that create a, a barrier for someone to, to, to get uh, good health care? And then it says here, um, yes, do you think that telehealth makes um, patients take a more active role in their care? Um, Alana, do you want to go ahead and lead off and then... Yeah, I would say it's been fascinating. I, I think the adoption and uh, the ability for people to adapt to telehealth has been far better than I expected. Uh, I deal uh, with a lot of geriatric aged patients, octogenarians that I thought wouldn't be able to uh, perform a telehealth visit, but you ask them, uh, you know, what they're doing to chat with their grandkids across the country. They're using FaceTime, they're using WhatsApp. So you try to walk them through the process. And I've been very surprised. Um, I will say that there are uh, financial limitations, of course, in some populations who do not have capacity to utilize smartphones with video capability. Uh, fortunately, we are being uh, afforded the opportunity opportunity to do audio uh, visits with patients as well. If, if we cannot successfully do uh, synchronous audio visual, we can perform telephonic visits, which I still think are very useful. So, um, you know, as long as somebody has a, a phone line, which again, in some populations that could also be limiting. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, I would say I noticed uh, on the QA box that uh, a person was asking about access. And I think Telehealth does afford us the opportunity to enter into rural landscapes where there is, for example, a, a specialist in, in that uh, medical condition may not be nearby, maybe a three-hour drive to and a three-hour drive home uh, from seeing an expert in a problem where now with the click of a button, you can be connected. So uh, I think it's helping areas that are underserved in terms of uh, just having physicians at at that geography, uh, and that's that's very useful. So I think um, I, I try to tell my patients who say, "Well, I'll see you in three months when COVID's gone." I mean. COVID's not gone. Um, to, to echo what Dr. Borelli said, we have no idea what's ahead of us. We cannot kick the can down the road. Um, and uh, we, we have to start addressing issues. Uh, I do worry not just about the long-term effects of being infected with this virus, but what about all the 
healthcare preventative screening mechanisms that people are not doing. Uh, all the all the annual mammograms that are getting postponed, the fifty yeah. year old colonoscopy, you know, uh, PSAs. I'm talking about not just will this be a virus that causes long term deleterious health effects uh, to humans. But what about the diseases we know of that are not being addressed? So I tell patients with respect to telehealth, if you have an issue, seek the evaluation uh, via the telehealth platform. And if imaging is necessary uh, because of whatever you're complaining about, uh, most diagnostic centers are taking very extreme measures to keep safety at play and that we really should not ignore health issues. Could be COVID related, could could not be COVID related, but don't ignore them. Uh, connect with someone, and uh, you know, using this type of platform is the best way to do it. Yeah, you know, I want to echo what Dr. Oberstein just said, and uh, you know, I was due for my uh, colonoscopy, and I had the Colaguard test, which is it ships to your home, and it's very very accurate. And probably if we switch to that wholeheartedly, we probably still have pretty good uh, detection rates for colon cancer. Can I just like, chime in there as well? Yeah, actually? yes, yes. You know, going on that in um, like the, the the hospital I work for is in downtown Toronto. It's a transplant center, but it serves the whole province of Ontario. And we had introduced that maybe about a year and a half ago, where we would do telehealth type visits. Um, because some of our communities or our people came from communities that were maybe three or four hours drive away or an hour or two flight or even eight hours drive. And then we're also hindered in the winter by um, inclement weather or, you know, minus 27 degrees and three foot of snow. So ideally, we would see our post-transplant patients, they would go to their local hospital where they were already familiar with, and that was the hospital that referred them for a kidney transplant, the nurse there would check their blood pressure, do their weight, you know, do a physical assessment, and then the doctor would come online and see them as well. Obviously, that's not happening as much as hospitals are restricting access and, and you know, they don't want unnecessary visits. But that's the way we were progressing towards anyway. And I feel that, you know, medicine, like we've all been talking about, is going to change. And people are, are about coming into a hospital unnecessarily. Of course, like Alana said, we are going to see the effects of, like what Dr. Borelli does in medical imaging, we're not getting diagnostic tests done like maybe we should, which is going to, we're going to see the, the, um, the um, evidence of that maybe in a, a year or two, which is quite unfortunate. If I can jump in, please. Um, so I, I even though I acknowledge and I agree with my fellow panelists that telemedicine or telehealth can improve access, um, but there is more to access than just to engender communication. Um, access has to do um, with whether or not if people or certain communities um, will actually be able to um, benefit from certain services. Um, so one of the things that I would really hearken us to do, um, particularly as we move toward a telemedicine or remote um, modality of medicine, is that um, particularly vulnerable populations never had an issue with communication. They had um, problems with accessing the right people at the right time with the necessary coverage. Telemedicine in many ways, unless it flips the business model of medicine whereby people can still gain access to the necessary healthcare providers and services regardless of coverage, that is where medicine can move forward. Um, so I would just really want to caution us to not say or to see telemedicine, and I'm not saying anyone has done this, but we don't want to see it as a panacea that can cure all the necessary or the significant social determinants of health that have plagued us. Um, I think telemedicine in many ways, if we want it to be fully um, accessible for all, is that we need to create systems that can connect different services. That is the key thing that we need to underscore with regards to telemedicine. So if you are going to do that, can you connect that? Because I can tell you this, 
um, telemedicine is not just something that will um, will shrink um, you know boundaries or distance because we find that many of our urban um, um, patients still have problems with um, access. Um, and even though they're two blocks away from NYU or one of our other health systems, there is a significant burden there. So I just want to you know mention that, and I think other panelists have mentioned the idea of health equity where some people may not be able to afford it, but it's not just being able to afford or to speak with a healthcare provider. It's the other things that they don't get access to in the entire ecosystem of healthcare. I'd like to jump in here, guys, and, and, ahead, yeah. and, and thank you for, a, for an amazing panel. Uh, I think we could talk about this all day long and, 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 and really break down each one of these subjects into their own, to their own meeting. I, will, I just wanted to add on to Dr. Satius's uh, comment, and that is I know that we're already seeing a lot of early medical errors as a result of the transformation over to telehealth is now the primary. Uh, so we need to, you know, Dr. G Dr. Gimeno used to always say, listen, your hands, your eyes, your ears, your nose, those are still the, a physician's most valuable tools. And we can't forget about this. So I think the telehealth for our population, for a chronic sleep apnea population, I think is going to be a good sort of thing to help us manage our once we are diagnosed. But I think we still need to we need we need to touch our doctors. They need to see us. They need to listen to our heart. They need to, to smell us. They need to you know. So, Justine, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I think we're we're we're, we're approaching on three o'clock here, and I so I uh, just think we should kind of wrap some things up here. Um, I want to thank all of our experts and our patients on our panel for joining us, and um, you know to Kevin and and Austin and and Rich and his uh, transportation crew, and uh, give a huge big shout out to all of you out there on the front lines that are you know, making sure that all of us are safe and have everything that we need. And, and to our frontline, you know, clinicians like uh, Dr. Borelli and Dr. Oberstein, thank you for do using and doing whatever, um, whatever's around to help your patients. However you could do that, we, we appreciate that. Um, so Adam, is there anything else you'd like to say? Before we no, I, I, I think Dr. Partha Sarasi and, and said it earlier in, 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 the, in, the, in the earlier thing, it's, it's about us coming together, the healthcare field, the patients, the stakeholders, the providers, the different disciplines. Uh, this, this crisis has given us an opportunity to, to fix what's not working, to improve upon what is, and, and to really I start, I think, really maybe, in my perspective, to take the business out of... Uh, the conflict and the bias of what's of, of caring for patients on an everyday basis. And I, th I think once we do that, I think we'll start to see better long-term so-called preventative type of things done in this country. But listen, we're, we're, we're all going to learn a lot. We have a lot of Monday night quarterbacks and, 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 and new scientists and new epidemiologists and everybody's got the vocabulary, but you know, we're all in the same storm. We're just in different boats. So we're, we're, we're going to all paddle and get to the same place eventually, hopefully. But I want to thank you all so much for, 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 for providing us your time, from coming from all points around this country, uh, from all walks of life, uh, from all different perspectives. And I invite you back to come back and, and continue these conversations because I think we're going to be here for a long time. Happy to. Thanks for inviting me. I don't think we have to cover it all in one day, and then everybody should feel like we, like we, we, like we, we should. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, let's take a break, and we'll be coming back with Dr. Todd Swick, uh, who's going to be presenting on the role of orexin in sleep and wakefulness, uh, sponsored by Takeda.